Welcome to Living Hope. In today's message, Do What the Father Does, Apostle David John Rowe teaches how to hear the voice of the Spirit and be empowered to act on it. This morning, I uh, wanted to just to um, take a minute, and uh, recently we celebrated um, Father's Day, and um, the, there are those of us uh, who had poor examples as fathers, uh, and that taints how uh, we might see God. But in 1 John uh, 3, 1, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And so uh, this morning, uh, as believers, we want to believe what God says about himself, not what we experienced um, in our life. Our Father is a lot of different things. Our Heavenly Father is a lot of different things. And so um, he is a good Father. Uh, he is always a good father. And there are times when um, we have difficulty in life, and sometimes we want him to fix it. And uh, I think my brother preached a few weeks ago, and he said, so people ask him, so where is God? Well, God is in you, and you're the church. And sometimes where God is, is you. Amen? So he is a good father. And I put the Bible references here for those who want to watch the message again or look them up in context. But our Father, He is loving. He is caring. He is kind, incredibly kind. He is sovereign. And that means that even the plans of the devil work into His hand. Right? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Not our sin, not the devil, not uh, anything. He is sovereign over all. He sees everything and works it all together. He is compassionate. Right? We talked about it previously. Jesus wept for his friend. And of course, he did, uh, Lazarus did come to be raised from the dead, but he grieved with those who were grieving. He's a good shepherd, and I want to talk more about that this morning. He is giving, right? He gave his son as a sacrifice for the sin of the entire world, past, present, and future. He is ever-present, meaning that he is within you if you're a believer and co-mingles with your spirit, and I don't know how all that theology works, but he is ever-present, he is faithful. He is faithful. He doesn't always meet our timetables, but our God is faithful. Yeah. He is our refuge, which means that sometimes uh, we need a place to get out of the storm. Sometimes we need a place to be comforted. Sometimes we just need to get in our prayer closet with him. But he is a refuge. He is merciful. Um, none of us have gotten what we deserve. He is righteous. And he is strong. He is very strong. He's a healer. We've seen healing happen in this room. For those who were here a few weeks ago, um, we had friends come from the gate and church in Charlotte, and people were healed. We've had um, Dr. Peter McLuhan has prayed for the sick here in this room, and they have gotten well. He has prayed for the sick online, and they have gotten well. And you, there are people in this room. We had a meeting last week in this room, and we just asked anyone who had ever prayed for someone who got well to pray for three men who had cancer. And half the room came forward. So God is a healer, and he uses us. Yeah. He is forgiving, and this is a sermon all by itself. Uh, but there is nothing that you can do to separate yourself from the love of God. Nothing. He is powerful. Uh, recently, I was in Israel, and I saw Mount Carmel, and I remember how he showed up for Elijah, and he called down the fire. And then I was in Tunisia, and I stood where the prophets of Baal had sacrificed children. And then I understood the power that came on Mount Carmel. I, I had no idea the wickedness of Baal worship. 
And today people say, oh, it's just worship, you know, for rain and for crops and things like that. No, it was sacrificing humans. God is good. And we like to say that God is good all the time. And when you're going through a tough one, that is not an easy one. But there's a psalm here that you can read. God is good. He is the one who saves. It's really important to um, understand what salvation really is. What it is, is the freedom to enjoy God. To be with your Father. To be full of the Holy Spirit. To have joy when there's nothing to be joyful about. There's many things in the salvation of God. He is righteous. There is nothing that man can do. There is no law that man can write that will change the righteousness of God. There is no lie that can be told that will change the righteousness of God. He is our helper, and sometimes we need him to come alongside and assist us. Other times, we need to own it and take care of it for ourselves. And see, and those are the wisdom, and we're going to talk about some of the ways in which the Lord speaks to us so that we know whether to let him help us to do it for ourselves, or to just let him do it by himself. He is the one who makes all things new. I don't know about you, but in 1978, I became completely different in my heart than I had been before. And my experience was simple and yet stunningly profound. I, every time I thought about what God did that day that I learned that God was love, I wept. I, I tried to tell my friends what happened. And, and my friend is like, it's okay, it's okay. You don't have to tell, you don't have to cry, you don't have to tell me. And all I wanted to do was share with him what Jesus had done for me when I didn't even know who Jesus was, really. So, this is the moment that changed everything for me in Christianity, and I call it the aha moment. But there's a mystical relationship with the Father that's all throughout the book of Matthew. And after today, maybe if you go back and read that, you'll begin to see what it's like to have a good, loving, heavenly, righteous saving father. And then it said, um, it said, and Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the son of God can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing. And as believers, as Christians filled with his spirit, we can do a lot of things that look religious. We can take communion and not understand the depth of it. We can talk about Jesus and never know him. We can do feed the poor and never be connected to the things of God. He can only do what he sees the Father doing. And that's the title of my message today, is doing what we see the Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son, and he shows him all that he does. So the Father loves you, sons and daughters, and those of you of faith, and he will show you all that he does. Even more so, um, I'm going to skip here, this is the next thing, but it says, even though you are evil, in Matthew 7, 11, it says, God gives good gifts to his children. How much more would your Father in heaven give good gifts to them who ask? He is more willing to give us the gift of the Holy Spirit and fire that we could do what we see the Father doing. Recently, again, I was in Israel, and on Pentecost morning, around the same time that Peter preached his sermon where 3,000 people got saved and people spoke in tongues and appeared to be drunk in the spirit, I stood on the Temple Mount and I prayed in the spirit. And it was one of the most fascinating moments of my life to be near. I realize it's not the exact place, but to be near where all of these things took place in Acts chapter 2. 
He is more than willing to give us the Holy Spirit uh, so that we can do his will. But without the spiritual tools um, to be vessels, we, don't, we won't know what to do. So we only know our Father by this revelation that's been given. And so I'm going to take a minute and it says, my sheep listen to my voice and I know them. Just think about that for a moment. You can read the Bible and say, oh, I should give to the poor, visit someone in prison or pray for the sick. I can read this and do it. But it's much deeper than that. Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me. Right? So without this connection to heaven in which we do what we see the Father doing, we might be praying for a sick person when we might be giving a word of prophecy or we might be helping someone and actually assisting them in their own destruction sometimes. And then other times, uh, I always say the most spiritual Christians I know um, are the ones who show up when you say on Saturday, I'm packing up my house and we're moving. So sometimes the uh, helps is just very practical. So, how does God speak to us? Well, of course, he speaks to us through the scriptures. It's the infallible guide to Christianity. There's no other authoritative text, and I want to be very clear about that. But there are nine other ways in which God also speaks to us, and they are also uh, in the Bible. So, he speaks to us through his people. We have... Um, people in our community, people in this community, people in the online community that have revelation for us, right? What, what, what is being learned, preached here this morning is not what's being preached in Virginia Beach. Well, at least I don't think so. And it's not what's being preached in some other place. This message is for, for us and for those who have um, joined us online, and we welcome them. So God speaks through his people, and sometimes just the community of people who love us in a dark time, who encourage us in a, in a day when things are difficult, uh, is, is the thing that we need, right? When we say, you know, Lord, I just need your help, sometimes he just sends people. So he speaks through your circumstances, and uh, that's how I met Dr. Peter McClue, and I was uh, at a meeting that I actually didn't want to go to. Um, no, I, 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 I had a long day, and I, I just really didn't want to drive 40 minutes to the camp meeting, and I, I, I just didn't really want to do it. But I had four invitations to go to this meeting that I did not want to go to, and I thought, okay. And I still decided not to go, and then I spoke to my wife, who always knows where we're supposed to be, and we decided to go. And that's how I met him. But I met him by a word of knowledge about his cancer, which he was treated for a few days ago, and everything seems to be going well. But had I not shown up, today might not be possible. So the internal audible voice or sense or feeling or impression, um, people will say to me, well, when you prophesy, like, how do you know that? I don't know how I know it. I just kind of know it. And it's quiet. And it's direct revelation. And that's just how I know it. And sometimes I know people's names. Sometimes I know that they're sick or um, that they have a pastoral gift. I just know. And you can know too. Right? We talked about the, having the Holy Spirit. That's the gift that we were given. That's our knower. And so when we spend time using our knower, then we know. So he speaks in tongues and interpretations, although we don't see this very often in church. When I came to the Lord back in the late 70s and 80s, it was much more common. But then people tried to um, have a show. And then the show didn't go so well, so then they stopped doing the supernatural things because it was easier to have a bulletin and some of those things. So I'm just going to say that tongues and interpretations are for today. They're for now. Paul is very clear about that 
in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, he talks about how to use them uh, within a group. Uh, so tongues and interpretations. Spiritual song, both vocal and instrumental, and thank you for your music this morning. It moved my soul. Just hearing the piano by itself moved my soul. And those are ways that God can speak to us. And he can use our prayer language to give us a song language. And even if we don't sound really good, he loves that. So, uh, dreams and interpretations. Some people have spiritual dreams. I have them from time to time. I have friends who have them more regularly. One of the most recent ones was a friend of mine called and said, I'm new to this dream interpretation thing. And I had this dream and it was about a candle. And then it was about um, someone who had been in prison for 19 years and lay miserable. Doesn't really matter. But they didn't know that the two pieces went together. And they also didn't know that it was f for my daughter. And it was the a candle, and she went to the Catholic Church where they have light candles, votive or whatever it's called, and she had been there for all night for 19 years. Even though I did take her to other places, she really became imprisoned. And so the Lord said, I'm going to set her free um, from being there. It doesn't mean that God doesn't do anything in her life or care about her. That's not about that. The dream was my job. Uh, so the interpretation of the dream was to find a place to minister to my daughter who's 19 and I love very much. He speaks through prophets. And for those of you who uh, have heard my brother either at the prophetic conference that we had or last week or one of the other times he's been here more than once, he's a prophet. And uh, I value very much uh, his. And if I saw a recent uh, YouTube video that he did and he had a a v open vision about Virginia Beach and people coming out of the water and being saved. And then I noticed that Scott's here and we're going to do City Quake. And so I don't know how many baptisms you guys are planning on doing in the North Atlantic, um, but I'm, I'm ready to watch it happen. So he speaks through prophets. These last two, uh, he sends angels. So he sent an angel to Mary. He sent an angel to fix Paul's bad prophecy about the shipwreck. You might remember they were going to lose lives, and the angel came and said, wait a minute, you're not going to lose lives in the, in the book of Acts. Uh, these are generally reserved for significant uh, information to be brought to earth from heaven. Um, but there are angels, and I have a friend who sees them regularly, and they come to do all kinds of things. And so uh, it's just another way that God can commune with you, to speak to you, to show you what the Father is doing. And finally, uh, God's uh, audible voice, right? Um, Jesus was baptized, and what did God say? He said, "My son, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. The interesting thing is, if you read it carefully, is that not everybody heard it. Some people heard it, but it was audible. And so it happened other times. And this is usually for pretty big stuff, but I've heard the voice of the Lord, and, uh, and you can too, right? We, what I'm trying to do is build your faith. So whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, has rivers of living water that will flow from within you, right? So our, our job is to pray up, read the word. Like in, in our home, we listen to soaking music all the time. It's playing now. When we're in the car, it's playing. And when it's not playing, we're usually listening to the scriptures be read. Um, reading is not my favorite thing uh, these days. Um, but listening to the word, listening to soaking music, praising the Lord, listening to gospel music, whatever it is that fills you up to overflowing, having hands laid on you by people that are full of the Spirit. So, um, yeah. So how do we do it? We love others, right? That's it. I mean, that should, be, that should be the end of this message, but it's not. We have to be filled with the Spirit, right? We can't be on empty all the time 
and expect to have something to give. We need to spend some time with God. But really, if you're doing what you see the Father doing, he'll tell you how much time and when. Some people like to have a regular time in the morning with God or whatever. Uh, Other people, I just have a moment, and the Lord wants to speak, and I pull over and let him speak. So we hear God, right? That's the whole point, is that we need to hear God. We can't just do We have to hear and act. And we do all of this by faith. And um, I'm more convinced that faith is a lot easier when we just hear God and do it than when we try to have faith for something that God doesn't want to do. I mean, I was dismayed when my mother got cancer and the Lord said, "Um, I'm not going to heal her. And I thought, wait a minute. I want you to heal her, and I wanted to declare healing. And he said, you know what I'd really like you to do? I'd really like you to call her every single day and tell her how much you and I love her. And so I did that for over three months, and then I went to visit her in her last days, and we prayed for her. And my kids were on one side of the bed, and I was on the other. And the fire of God fell in the room and the hospice nurse was laying under the bed, quaking and twitching. My brother, my stepfather, couldn't get in the door. And she shone, I mean, was lit up. And when it was over, she pulled my head close to her lips and she said, David, I am now ready for glory. That's what God wanted to do. I wanted her healed. We need to hear God. We need to do it. So there's lots of ways to hear from God, and I'm going to list them. And again, uh, if you go back and watch the message, I'm giving you uh, examples from the Bible, but I don't want to read every single one. You can read the Bible yourself. There's the message or the word of wisdom. Hey, Jesus, what do we do with this woman taken in adultery? Should we stone her? Well, Jesus said, how about this? If you're without this sin, you can throw a stone. And what they do? They drop their rocks and they left. And if you read it in context, it's really about that sin. And we've heard it preached many times. And then there was the uh, uh, coin. Well, do, what do we do with the, the money? Do we, he said, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God. That's godly wisdom. That's the kind of wisdom that we can give others if we're listening to God. There's the message of the word of knowledge. Jesus said to the woman at the well, you've had five husbands, but the one you're with, that's not your husband. But he did not shame her. Good prophetic voices never shame people. Never. Do you know she was so excited she went and told the whole village? But they already knew. She'd been going to the well at midday because she was an outcast anyway. So that is a word of knowledge. It usually comes to set someone up for a prophecy which will create a destiny that wasn't there before. And what was her destiny? It was to worship Jesus. That's what he told her. And when we do prophetic ministry, sometimes we'll say, oh, I know that uh, someone has XYZ situation, but here's what God wants to do next. And so one is knowledge of a known thing, and the other one is creating a prophetic destiny, that which is not as though it is. So there's a word of faith. And when I went to the meeting where I met Dr. Peter McLuhan, I told the Lord, I'm not prophesying here tonight. This is just too much trouble. And he said, well, would you give someone a word of faith? And I said, I'd be glad to. And so when I finally got a chance to be with Peter, and I didn't recognize him because where I sat, and he was dressed with a cap and ready to go. And I said, are you the person who spoke the message tonight. He said, yes, I am. I said, well, the Lord has a word of faith for you. He said, it's a little C and not a big C, and you're not going to die from this because God said, I'm the big G, not the little G. And that's all I heard God say. And then I said, if you would call me tomorrow, 
I'd be happy to share my journey. And Peter had treatment with the exact same doctor that I did. And um, I call him, I'm sorry, I, Dr. Peter McLuhan. I, I'm very respectful of who he is and all that he's worked for to be in the church. Um, but we've become pretty close friends in the midst of all this. So anyway, that's a word of faith. Then there's many gifts of healing. It's plural. So we can have gifts of healing for cancer and gifts of healing for inner healing and lots of other things. Then we have miraculous powers. So healing is not a miracle. A miracle is like laying hands on a car that doesn't work and it starts. That's a miracle. And I saw lots of things like this happen when I was, especially when I was in the Word of Faith movement. God just did amazing things. The, the, the coin that appeared in the fish's mouth. Miracle. Throw your net out on the other side. Peter catches 153 after he'd spent the whole night uh, not. So uh, those were m miracles. And so we need to be open to those. And I've noticed that people in the apostolic ministry tend to do more signs and wonders, miracles. And people who are evangelists and pastors tend to be more about healing. That's what I've noticed. It's, I'm, it's not scriptural. I've just tends to be the way I've seen it. Anyway, the ding distinguishing between spirits is my favorite one. What does this really mean? Like that we know that something's evil? Well, I was at a home group one night and someone came in, in the kitchen, I could hear them and I was in a different room and they said, prayer is the foundation of the church. And I went, oh, well, welcome Satan. The church is a house of prayer. The foundation of the church is the prophetic and apostolic, and Jesus is the cornerstone. And when he came into the other room, we had a little power encounter that included casting out some demons and getting filled with the Holy Spirit. That's distinguishing between spirits. That's not just deciding that we hate what God hates or something like that. This is hearing God and knowing and acting. So, speaking in different kinds of tongues, languages, and the interpretation of those, we've been through that. So, um, how do we do it? I'm just going to go through a, a kind of quickly a list of gifts that are in the Bible, and you can find them, but they're not all in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 8 and Ephesians 4. They're scattered in some other places. So, uh, maybe when you have a chance, you'll listen to the video. Um, anyway, there's prophecy. There's different levels of it. There's the you and me prophetic level. There's the person with the prophetic gift. That's my service gift. I can prophesy over anyone, anytime that I want. Just open the faucet. And I enjoy that, and I love that. Uh, then there's ministry or administration. That's a gift. Uh, there's teaching. But then there's equipping, which is different. See, the people in the ministries of prophet, apostle, pastor, teacher, evangelist. We equip others to do the work. We do the work, but we equip others to do the work. That's a different kind of teaching than the teaching which uh, Dr. McLuhan has. His teaching gift is amazing, the line upon line, just stunning. There's exhortation and encouragement. There's giving, and we all have opportunities to give, but what happens if you're in church and you sit next to someone and the Lord says, I need you to write them a check for 50 bucks? Or I need you to put $1,000 in the building fund? So that's a gift. And when we hear God, it's a lot easier to give. It's a, it, right? we, all, we all know the fact is that God can outgive us. Yeah. We know that. But are you willing to bet $1,000 on it right now for someone in the room. I don't know. I'm not asking you or saying that that needs to take place. Uh, what I'm saying is when you hear God and you do what you see the Father doing, that's a possibility. Leading. Simply the ability to humbly take charge, not control. Leaders who take control. Um, it's not an American corporation. It's not a business. Leaders are people who have an idea and someone wants to follow them. And there was a woman at one church I went and 
she saw the day-old bread or whatever they called it, that the, the, the store couldn't sell it because it was out of date by a day. So she would go and get those and took people into a more impoverished section of our city and they would knock on doors and give out bread. Hundreds of people came to Christ. Healings were, we had more healings in one day of doing that than we had in church in a week. All the gifts are not for just for this room. And so leading is, is having a godly idea and hearing from God and being able to take others with you. It could be home group. It could be kids ministry. It could be quake. It could be any of those things. And then there's mercy. And this is a supernatural ability to contend with the needs of others. And I, and I have a very close friend and I can't, it hurts my heart to know some of the things that have been said about him because he just doesn't fit in real easily. And yet his intercession and his ability to love because of the mercy of God is profound. And I consider him in my top five. And I just, I love the mercy of God. So evangelism, and I think Scott's going to get a chance to come up here and talk to us about the local thing. Um, but evangelism is just sharing the good news. It's loving someone enough. My friend Jimmy, hey, David, God is love, and I love you. And Paul and Chuck, these guys with me, we love you too. And we don't care what you've done or where you've been or how much money you make or don't make, or what kind of car you drive. I was 19 years old, man. I was blown away. And that's all they did. And it changed my entire life forever. There's a pastoral gift, and I know a lot of people think that it's always up front and leading a church, but it's not. It's just being a peaceful listener who can hang out with other people that have needs and feel valued. Preaching. Where's my brother here? He's got the preach all over him. I don't. I'm a teacher. But I love good preaching. Preachers speak to the heart. Teachers speak to the mind. And both are important. We have worship. I love worship. I worship all day. I play, but there's lots of worship. Music, art, dance, flagging. Giving is worship. It's an outward expression of the glory of God within us. Just let it out. Helps. Again, this is the one who's ready to lend a hand. When we move, um, our favorite helps people will be there to help us. Hospitality. Having people in your home uh, or here making coffee. Making people feel welcome in Jesus' name. Then we have deacons, which you know about, who do the work to assist those. We have elders who are focused on teaching and, uh, and, and uh, the spiritual atmosphere of a church. And then there's deliverance. Casting out demons. This is a special call. Break curses. Stop the uh, demonic oppression. These are always craftsmanship. Who gave me the little you, sir? That's craftsmanship. And thank you for your gift. Makes you feel good to do it. But it, it's better when I receive it and now it's a testimony. And I can say, hey, I mentioned craftsmanship for the, in the first time ever in a message. And I received a craft that was beautifully done, thoughtfully done, and done with the gifting of God today. And so thank you. And then there's intercession. And we need lots of intercession. And if you're an intercessor... Um, you can put me on your list every day. I have one guy who texts me every morning, and I, uh, I need more of that. I'm alive because of him. I was in hospice in January, and I got healed in February, and I'm standing here, and it's July now. Pretty good. And it was because of intercession. So I'm going to leave my message there, but I do would like those in the room, to, if you'd like to just stand and pray, I, I want to pray over you before I walk away. So if you'd like to join me, Father, you're 
a great giver. You're a wonderful father. You gave us the Holy Spirit so we would know what we're doing. You gave us Jesus so we would understand salvation. And you gave us the ability to see what you're doing. And you gave us the gifts so that we could do it. And so this morning, Lord, I ask that in this room and online, that those who truly desire any of the gifts that I listed here today, one of them, two of them, nine of them, all of them, Father, I pray that you would impart those gifts to them and that you would release your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.